Baroness Simons of Vernon Dean is a senior Labour member of the House of Lords and a former Minister for the Middle East, Minister for International Trade, Minister for Defence Procurement, and Prime Minister's envoy to the Gulf. She's chair of the Arab-British Chamber of Commerce and of the UK side of the Saudi-British Joint Business Council. She also chairs the British Egyptian Society and sits on advisory boards of British expertise, the uh, Egyptian British Business Council, the D Group, the Board of Manchester Airports. She's head of government relations international at DLA Piper LLP. And with her wide range of experience in the Middle East in particular, advises a number of commercial organizations, including the CCC Group, Blenheim Capital, in which I have to admit to a certain interest, and Protection Group International. Will you please join me in warmly welcoming Baron and Simons to the podium? Well, Eugene, thank you very much indeed for that a very uh, generous welcome. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, our colleagues, friends, um, it really is a great pleasure to be here today to talk to you, and thank you very much for the invitation to do so. Um, I must also say it's a great pleasure to be back in St Anthony's, where I was the parliamentary fellow, one of the two parliamentary fellows, with David Steele uh, a, a couple of years ago. So um, it felt very familiar coming back here today. Well, as Eugene has said, I chair the Arab-British Chamber of Commerce and I've had various roles formerly in another life as a minister. And so I suppose it's not very surprising that I have developed some long-term views about business, about trade and the investment relationship with the countries of the Arab League in general and very particularly with the GCC. And perhaps I should state the obvious at the outset, that although there are, of course, many overarching issues and trends, practices, customs, which bind the GCC together, I do think it is important to remember that these are individual countries. They are individual sovereign states, which they can and sometimes do have very different views politically, and, of course, they have very different views in terms of their foreign policy priorities. Of course, of course, they've got a, foreign, foreign, a common language, they share a lot of religious belief, um, and, of course, they come together through the GCC to make common cause in terms of trade and foreign policy. But it's also worth remembering that they are in competition. They are competitors for inward investment. Sometimes their competitorship for the lead, they are in competitorship for the leadership role in foreign policy, and sometimes in some of their customs and practices. And it's also worth remembering that despite efforts over the last few years to create a common currency, they are as much rivals as they ever have been to individually want to be the financial hub of the GCC. Currently, they also share many challenges in uh, an ever-changing world economy, based as they are in that part of the world, which is full of turmoil, of political undercurrents, and the threat of instability because of the violent upheavals in Syria, Iraq, Libya, and Yemen. Now, in some ways, of course, those are all very different <coughs> conflicts, but they are all characterised by sectarianism, by religious extremism, and by the terrible violence which has led to the mass exodus of tens of thousands of migrants, women, men, children, who are all prepared to risk their lives to escape violence and terrorism. Now, the Gulf is part of this already. Of course it is. Um, not necessarily directly, but through the political ties that they have, the military support that some of them give, and the strong advocacy that many of them make in international councils, uh, in which, of course, the GCC participate. The Gulf countries may not be experienced the same levels of violence and terrorism, but they are directly affected by its proximity, and they are militarily engaged, at least in part, and acutely aware of the threat to the stability of their own countries. They can't take that stability for granted. But, and of course it is a very big but, 
they are very different economies. They range from the huge economy of Saudi Arabia with its population of 31 million now and increasing very rapidly and a GDP of over 630 billion a year to tiny Bahrain with its population of only 1.3 million and a much smaller GDP of 30.4 billion. But what all these countries have in common is a real need to diversify their economies and to create jobs, especially for young people. Saudi Arabia now has almost 30% of its population aged under 15. That is, 10 million Saudis who are going to need jobs very soon, and jobs which are commensurate with a very high level of educational achievement in that country. And that's for both young women as well as young men. It's important to realise that although there are some real differences in the way that men and women are treated in Saudi Arabia, women are entering the workforce in ever-increasing numbers. So diversification of the, GC, the GCC economies has been a real an ever-present imperative since the United Nations report, which many of us remember being written some 16 years ago or so. But of course, the now additional and very recent pressure for, on the Gulf states um, is, to, um, is because of the really sharp, really dramatic fall in the price of oil. I know that it's recovering to a certain extent at the moment, but it is unlikely to go back to the levels that it was. So the sufficiency, the self-sufficiency that the United States is now able to demonstrate in terms of its own energy supplies because of fracking is having a direct effect on what is happening in the GCC. This is a real pressure, not only in terms of annual income and annual expenditure. It's a real pressure in the fact that many countries are now having to dig deep into their reserves. Moreover, of course, at a strategic and political level, the lessening of United States dependence on Arab oil implies the possibility of the United States identifying its self-interest as less linked to the security of the oil-producing Arab states than used to be the case. One United States senator remarked to me last year, he said, when our strategic interests are not dependent on Arab oil, who is going to defend the Gulf states? Well, the US is no longer dependent on Arab oil, and the US's relationship, for example, maybe because of that, with Iran is changing. Indeed, the West in general is supporting normalising the relationship with Iran in relation to the regular inspections that that country has now said can be undertaken on its nuclear capabilities. And Iran is undoubtedly coming closer to the Committee of Nations. Now, why is this relevant? Well, the GCC, whilst openly accepting that change, at least in my experience, the GCC remains deeply sceptical. Trust doesn't grow overnight. When I visit the region, and particularly when I'm in Saudi Arabia, I hear as much concern about Iran's role in the region as ever. Huge concern about Iran's alleged territorial ambitions, about its dominance with Hezbollah, about what is happening in Iraq, particularly, of course, again, with the sectarianism is that they're there, and about possible intervention in Bahrain with its largely Shia population, and, of course, on Saudi's own borders, what is happening in Yemen. Moreover, there is the relationship with Syria and the Iran support of the Alawite regime and the coming together with Russia as far as Syria is concerned. Meanwhile, at home, the Gulf states recognise that stability and prosperity are two sides of the same coin and that investment in people is vital. Investment not only in health and education, but also in physical infrastructure. And as a result, all are now striving to transform their infrastructure and nowhere more than in their transport. For example, the Gulf rail links 
the metros in, Q in Kuwait and in Riyadh, the radical changes that there have been in air transport and the flourishing of the new airlines and the upgrading of airports and the improvement in roads, the huge explosion in building projects right the way across all the Gulf states. And there is the determination throughout the region to invest as well in human capital, in education and research, in de and development, whether that development is into healthcare, from primary healthcare to the, to the specialist services that are now available in ca on cardiac conditions, over cancer, and of course, over the all too prevalent issue of diabetes. These plans have been in place, of course, since the days of huge oil profits, but expectations of the people have been raised. The people have been told that housing will be available, an enormous problem still in Saudi Arabia, schooling and hospitals, as well as jobs and prosperity. The people have been told that these are the ingredients of a worthwhile life, and they will be put in place. But the means to pay for them for all these ambitious projects is now under worse pressure than it has ever been. And the, the long-term concerns about developing uh, the Gulf economies is now a real important imperative, I think not only for them, but for their trading partners too. Private sector reforms, uh, which I know the first panel today is going to discuss, is of course one of the urgent issues. The Kuwait Stock Exchange, as we all know, has been gaining its prominence, establishing itself throughout the region, and is possibly going to become one of the most important stock exchanges, not only regionally, but worldwide. And the recently published forward to the ambitious Saudi reform program called Vision 2030 um, includes the privatisation of the Saudi Stock Exchange. I was in uh, Riyadh just about a month ago and I met with the head of the stock exchange there and I asked him whether this privatisation would go hand in hand, as we all know, with the privatisation of Aramco, but whether we might expect joint listing on the London Stock Exchange. And he replied that well, that was a conversation to be continued. But there are some very interesting points for us there about joint listings, if we're going to talk later about those issues in terms of how London is reacting. Indeed, the Saudi government um, has set out the most sweeping set of reforms in this document, Vision 2030, for the Saudi economy, including massive privatisation. And it states that Saudi has determined to become, and I quote, quote a global investment powerhouse to stimulate our economy and diversify our revenues. I'm sure that many of you here today will have already read this document, but I do think it is worth noting that it was presented for several hours on Saudi television by no less an important person than the Deputy Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who has personally nailed his colours and therefore the colours of his father to the mast. On this vision. One of the really interesting points is the prominence that the document gives not only to oil but to the other valuable min minerals on Saudi territory gold, phosphates, and of course uranium. The commitment to privatisation of Aramco, uh, which holds, I might say, all the key documents about where these important minerals are in Saudi Arabia, as well as to Marden, which is the mining company, is hugely significant, as well as the undertaking to transform the public investment fund into the world's largest sovereign wealth fund. An enormously, it's interesting, a lot of people think that Saudi already has a sovereign wealth fund like other countries. It's not. It's significantly different. And it's very interesting how they are now proposing to change that. And I'm sure, again, these cut points will be covered later today. Of course, the general moves towards privatisation across the Gulf is really important for us here in the UK. Public-private partnerships, full-scale privatisation and foreign investment are all at the top of the agenda. And London is recognised as the crucial centre for this in terms of advice, legal experience and financial capability. I was told earlier this year by the Saudis that the United States investors are now starting to invest through London rather than through New York 
and that our own strategic location, that is referred to theirs, of course, but our strategic location is vitally important in that respect, as is the long-standing relationship between the City of London and Saudi Arabia. So the session on the GCC financial markets will, I'm sure, shed more light on this today. Uh, not only what's happening um, in, in uh, Saudi, but also, of course, in Kuwait, in the UAE, and in Gaza. The importance of privatization, uh, privatization is at the heart of this throughout the Gulf. And it's crucial, for example, in Kuwait, where employment opportunities are almost overwhelmingly still bound, something like 95% still bound, into the public sector with only about 5% of employment in the private sector. So London's role um, in PPP, in privatisation, I should also say in the use of offsets um, for these projects is enormously important and a real opportunity for us here in the UK. Not only an opportunity in commercial terms, important as that is, but also an opportunity for strengthening further the already strong ties between ourselves and the GCC. And there is more that could be done. For example, in terms of uh, the ele electronic visa waivers, there is one for Kuwait. And Kuwait um, registered, um, since it came in at the end of February, 15,000 applications on the electronic waiver, um, waiver system. Now you might say, well, 15,000, why is that important? What its significance is that Kuwaiti tourists make more than 110 thousand visits to this country every year and they have the highest spend of any uh, nationals from any of the GCC countries. 110,000 visits and on average each individual uh, spends £4,000 per visit. Now you can do the maths as well as I can. I need to say something about a country I've not mentioned so far properly, and that's Oman, which in many ways is significantly different from its Gulf neighbours, culturally and in terms of its relationship with the UK. We are uniquely close to the state of Oman, something I came to recognise as a minister, particularly when I was working in the Ministry of Defence. The UK is the largest single investor into Oman, with 40% of all foreign direct investment. That's a huge percentage. Shell is the largest foreign partner in Oman's national oil company. It has a 34% stake in that country. And BP has just closed a £9.8 billion deal for a 30-year agreement on shale gas, which will supply 40% of that country's domestic, um, domestic gas needs. So Oman, so often overlooked in these discussions, is really important to the United Kingdom and to our trade and investment relationship. You know, so much is changing in the Gulf states, and as a country, of course we're engaged, of course we are, in trade and in investment and through our financial institutions. But we need to be so much more nimble, so much more proactive. One of the fallouts from the EU referendum has been that our European agenda has dominated our foreign policy agenda for most of this year. Now, we all know how important the vote is on the 23rd of June, but it has taken over, not only in our media, but in private discussions, public discussions, and very particularly, it has dominated our minister's agenda, particularly in the Foreign Office and in DBIS. This year... We had hoped for a really strong, refreshed engagement from the government with the six countries of the Gulf through what's called the Gulf Initiative. And I do hope that the Foreign Secretary's visit to the region last week will have injected some new energy into the relationship um, at a government level. Uh, my friends in the region tell me that is the case. We are still waiting the announcement here. But at a business level, I can tell you that we in the Arab British Chamber of Commerce are holding a, a conference in Lancaster House on July the 21st with the participation of the Secretary General of the Gulf States. And we want to focus on how we in the business community in this country can engage more fully in the changes that are taking place, how we can get engaged in the privatisation, the PPP, the offsets, and, of course, in the information technology, which will be so crucial. And coupled with that, 
and this is, I'm afraid, a really big issue, the cyber security, which every enterprise, public sector, private sector, civil society, is going to need at every level. I believe this is a really interesting, really vital agenda. It's important to the Gulf region, it's important to us here in the UK, and it is important that we help to grow the prosperity and secure the peace and stability of such an important part of the world in which we live. Thank you.